Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Sync Fusion webinar. Today, we'll be taking a look at Essential Studio for Xamarin with Visual Studio. My name is Whitney Hill. I'm the Video Marketing Specialist here at Sync Fusion, and I'll be moderating the webinar today. The webinar will be presented by Aaron Malamed, a Product Solutions Specialist here at Sync Fusion. So I know you all are really excited to see Aaron's code demo, but I'd like to briefly tell you about Sync Fusion and Essential Studio for Xamarin before we begin. Syncfusion delivers an extensive range of more than 800 web, mobile, and desktop controls, and also empowers businesses to get the most out of their data with our enterprise solutions for data processing and visualization. While our customers include some of the world's biggest companies, we do also work with many, many small businesses and independent developers. Lastly, if you're looking for some educational materials, we do provide the succinctly technical ebook series for free on our website, so be sure to check that out. Um, each of those ebooks has uh, about 100 pages on a technical topic. We do try to get uh, real in depth in, those, in that time, um, and we are constantly updating them. So again, do go in, uh, and check that out. So Syncfusion products have been compatible with Visual Studio for a long time, and that's continued with Visual Studio. 2017 with a unified installer, a new XAML previewer, and touch input for iOS uh, emulators. We have more than 90 components for Xamarin iOS, uh, Xamarin Android, and Xamarin Forms, and we're constantly adding to those. Some of our most popular controls are the data grid, the chart, the schedule, and the list views. And you'll see some of those in Aaron's demo in just a minute. He goes into a lot of detail and is uh, pretty thorough showing off some of those tools. We also offer a wide range of other controls, including a Kanban and file format libraries. Syncfusion adds new controls and features in quarterly releases. Many of these are based on requests from our customers, so we're always welcoming suggestions and feature requests, so do be sure to um, go ahead and go to our forums or put in a, a support ticket, and we'll see what we can do for you. So now that you know a bit more about Syncfusion, I'll hand over to Aaron, and he'll get started with demonstrating a simple expense tracker built in uh, Visual Studio using Essential Studio for Xamarin. Aaron, I'm going to transfer over to you now. All right, thank you, Whitney. Let me go ahead and share my screen. All right, so before we get started, I wanted just to take a little bit of time and just thank everyone for joining today's session. Really appreciate your time. So um, before we dive into the actual code, I wanted to take a minute and actually explain the app that we're going to uh, be working with. So as Whitney mentioned, we're going we're gonna to be looking at a simple expense tracking application. Uh, and this particular application makes use of our most popular Xamarin Forms controls. So primarily we're going to be looking at our data grid, our list view, and our chart controls, but we're also going to quickly take a look at our autocomplete and numeric text box controls. Now before we dive directly into the code, let's go ahead and take a look at that finished application. So on my screen you see uh, an actual mirrored uh, view of my phone, in this case a Galaxy S7. So this is an Android device, um, and this is the actual application. So when you first load it up, you're taken to this page, which is an overview page. And this contains an example of our data grid. And so you can see here on the, on the left-hand column, we're using a data template. So we're, we're showing off an, an icon and then a category for that icon. Uh, and then on the far right, under the balance column, you can see that we're, uh, we're showing some numerical values, but we're also showing some conditional styles uh, based on those numerical values. So when we get into the code, we'll definitely take a look at how that was done and how easy it is to implement. Next, we're also going to take a look at the transactions page. And so this is showing off an example of our list view control. And so in this case, you can see that we have a, a list of transactions in there, in this case, by default, uh, grouped by category. And you can see, again, the same data template, data template we saw before. So we have the icon next to the category name, and that's how we're grouping by grouping all the transactions by. But we do also have the option of changing uh, the grouping template. You can see here we can also, also choose to do it by date. And so if we do that, as you'd expect, uh, the grouping header becomes the date that the transaction took place on, and then of course all the transactions are sorted by that grouping template. And so again, when we dive into the code, we'll take a look at how that was done. And lastly, on the add trans or the transactions uh, page, we have the add transactions. Uh, section here, or this view. And so what we have here is the ability to add additional transactions. And so what we see here with the spent 
uh, text box. This is actually our numerical text field. And you'll see that as soon as I click on that, it brings up the appropriate numerical keypad. So that allows me to add another transaction. Then we have a categories uh, a list view here so we can see um, uh, various categories we can choose from. And then we also have descriptions uh, text box. And this is actually our um, this is actually our autocomplete control. So if I start to type something in here, you'll see that it automatically uh, makes some suggestions for me. All right. And then next, we're going to take a quick look at our category and budget page. And so this page has another example of our data uh, data grid. Although we're not going to spend too much time here, since this is a um, a simpler implementation of what we saw on the overview page. So we'll take a look at it in the code, but we won't spend too much time with that one. And then lastly, we're going to look at the trends page. And here, this is probably the most interesting of all the pages that are the examples that we have in this app, because as you can see, this is utilizing our chart controls. And we actually have two different charts on this page. And what's really interesting about this implementation is that uh, as I click on the various data points on this column chart, you'll see that the pie chart underneath automatically changes to reflect the data um, that's relevant to that specific data point. So in this case, the data points are uh, various months. and so We'll take a look at how that was done as well when we look at the code. And so throughout the demo, I'm actually going to leave this window here so that you can actually uh, see the app as we dive through the code. So you have some uh, a visual point of reference as we dive in through the code. Um, and now before we get into Visual Studio itself, I do actually want to uh, talk a little bit about how you can actually get started with uh, Syncfusion itself. How do you actually get your Syncfusion components inside of Visual Studio? So once you've acquired a license, whether it be um, a community license or, or, or another one of our licenses, you can come to the uh, Syncfusion download portal and here you have a couple of different options. So you can either download everything that we have, so our, uh, which would be our Enterprise Studio. So this will give you access to all the component libraries for all of the platforms that we support as one big file. That would install all of the necessary assemblies as well as any relevant templates um, for the various projects you might want to use those components for. Or if you prefer, you can come down here to the platform section. You can find the specific platform you're looking for, so in this case Xamarin, and just download those components. And again, it would download all of the assemblies as well as any relevant templates um, inside of Visual Studio. Now, if you prefer, we do also support NuGet packages. So if you prefer um, to install our assemblies that way, you can do that as well. So uh, if you come to our website and go to help.syncfusion.com, you can, for example, click on our Xamarin Forms documentation. And on the left side, if you click on Download and Installation, you'll see that we do have a section dedicated to configuring the Syncfusion NuGet packages in Visual Studio. So we have support for that as well, and it's very well documented here. All right, and now that we've gotten that out of the way, we can go ahead and dive right into the actual application. So uh, first, I'm going to go ahead and reset this back to the overview page. And now let's pull that page up in Visual Studio. All right, so let me zoom in a little bit on this code. So starting on line seven and nine, what we have here is our binding context. So you can see here that we've defined an expansive view model, and we'll actually take a, a deeper look into that uh, a little bit later when we get into some of the other pages. But for now, just keep in mind that we are using uh, this view model for this page. Uh, moving on, if we scroll down to lines 38 through 87, we can actually see the data grid itself. All right, and if we look further down at lines 39, 40 and 41, we can see where we start to map out the columns for that data grid. Moving on, lines 49 through 60, so starting here, this is where we define the, the data template for that, um, for that category column. So what you can see here, here we have the, uh, the binding statement for the image. So for the image source, we're actually using a converter. And so here we have an image converter defined. And then underneath that, we have the actual label where we're pulling in the uh, category name. So let's actually go ahead and jump into that image converter so we can see what that's doing. All right, so here on our uh, converters file, uh, the very first one we have is that image converter. And you can see that this is actually a very simple implementation. So all that we're doing is looking at the value of the category and appending 
.png to the end of it to create that file resource a reference. So the only the only one that's different here is the health and wellness category. As you can see, it's not a single word. It's uh, you know, three words with the ampersand in the middle, so we had to uh, manually convert that to health.png. But for all the other ones, we're just taking the value, converting to string, look, making them lowercase, and then appending .png. And that's all that that image converter is doing. All right. And now if we look at lines 75 through 79, Here we can see the data template for that balance column. So that on the right there, that had the conditional styles. So if we look at that, we can see that we're first binding to the actual uh, numerical value that comes up for the balance. So this is the, the actual balance value, and then we're formatting it as currency, essentially. And you can see here we have another property called background color that has a binding statement. And this is using another um, converter, converter, in this case, the cell background color converter. And so let's actually take a look at this one to see how we're getting those conventional styles. All right, so here on line 58, we have our cell background color converter. And again, you can see that we have a relatively simple implementation of this. And all that we're doing is we're looking at the values returned for the balance, and then we're using that to determine which color to return for that background color. So if the value is greater than 80, we return this color, and if it's greater than 100, we return that color, otherwise we return white. And so, and that's all that's doing. So when we come back to our overview page, you can see that we're returning a color value for our background color property. So very simple, nothing too extravagant there. So you can, you can see how easy it is to implement some of these uh, more complicated looking uh, uh, features here. All right, and that pretty much covers the overview page. Let's move on to the next page, which is transactions. So again, this was showing an example of our uh, list view control. So let's go ahead and pull this one up in Visual Studio. All right. So once again, lines 9 through 11, we're looking at that binding context of the expense view model. And if we move along, we see on lines 13, and 14 that we're actually adding some additional toolbar items um, up there on the toolbar. So that would be the options icon here as well as the plus icon for the Add Transactions page. And we'll actually come back to the options uh, button so we can actually see how the grouping uh, templates are actually achieved. Um, but if we move on, if we look at lines 21 through 44, we can see the data template for the expense by category um, uh, grouping template that we have here. So essentially all that we're defining is um, how, we're, how we're displaying these transactions. So we're pulling in the name of the transaction. So as you can see here on the very first one, home insurance is the name of the transaction. Then underneath that we have the date uh, and, then, and then this is how we're formatting it here, month, day, year. And you can see that underneath the transaction. And then finally on the second column of this uh, data template we have the amount spent for that transaction. So that is the default um, uh, expense by category data template that we have. Uh, and then next on, on lines 46 through 52, we have our expense by category header data template. So that's the, uh, the template you see here with the icon next to the uh, name of the category. And again, this is the same as we saw on the overview page. So we have an image where the source is being bound to this image converter, and then the label is being bound to the name of that category. And so it is the same image converter that we saw before. All right, and then moving on to line 54 through uh, 77, we have our expense by date data template. And so this is very similar to what we saw with the expense by category. But if I switch the app to display the view by date um, grouping uh, template, you'll see that the only thing that's really changed here with the transactions is that we've replaced the date underneath the transaction name with the category that it belongs to. And that makes sense since we're now displaying the date as the grouping uh, or as the group header. So now we have uh, all these transactions grouped by the date that they occurred, so we no longer need to display the date underneath the actual transaction itself. And so moving on, if we look at line 79 through 84, we can then see the data template for that expense by date header where again, we're simply pulling in the date the transaction occurred and then we're formatting it. 
All right, and then lastly, on lines 90 through 92, we have the actual list view itself. So you can see here that all we're doing is binding everything that we need to get this to display. So we're binding our item source and our data source. And then we're also uh, setting the default view, which in this case, we're setting our item template to the expense by category uh, uh, template, and then our grouping data source, or sorry, our grouper, group header template. Um, that will be the expense by category header. So again, the default is um, expense by category uh, as our, our default grouping option. So now that we covered that, let's, let's actually take a look at how we're changing um, the grouping templates. So as I mentioned before, we have this toolbar item here um, that connects to our options button. So let's actually uh, peek into that to see how it works. So whenever you click on that options button, so let me go ahead and do that, you'll see that we're actually displaying an action sheet. And so this will be a, because we're using Xamarin Forms, this would actually be a, uh, uh, a platform native action sheet. And in this case, we're displaying three, three objects. So we have a cancel button, and then we have our two um, selections, so view by category or view by date. And all we're doing is utilizing a simple if-l statement. So if the action is view by category, then we set our, our item template our, and our group header template to the appropriate expense by category data template. And then we're also calling to our view model to a function called group by, and then we're setting that, that value to category. And then of course we're doing the same thing for expense by date. If that, is, that option is selected, then we just change all those appropriate values to expense by date. So pretty simple, nothing really special uh, or too complicated going on there. So let's go ahead and back that out of that. All right, and that pretty much covers the transaction page. So as I mentioned, uh, very, uh, very simple implementation of all these various features. So the last thing that we're going to look at on transactions is the other toolbar uh, item that we had, which was the Add Transactions um, button. So let's go ahead and click that and bring that page up inside of uh, Visual Studio. Okay. So here uh, we're pulling in a couple, uh, some different resources. So here we have an autocomplete converter that we're pulling in um, as our as our resource for this page, and then we also have at the top we have a different toolbar item, which you can see here is this done button. So whenever you're you've added in all your transaction details, you can click done to actually save it. And then if we look at line 40, this is where we are implementing our numeric text box. And this in this case, we're not really uh, doing anything special with it other than just uh, using it to collect uh, or to specify the currency value. And so, you know, of course, when you click on it, you get the appropriate um, numerical keypad being displayed on the device. And if we keep scrolling on line 58, you can see where we've implement, implemented the autocomplete uh, control. And so here we've got a couple of things going on. So here, if we look at the um, the binding statement for it, you can see that we're, we're binding to that autocomplete converter um, that we saw earlier. So let's go ahead and take a look at what that is and what it's doing. Okay, so here it is on line uh, 109. And you can see that all it's really doing is it's pulling in all of the transactions from our uh, from our data model essentially, and then looking for all the transaction details that contain the value that was typed in to the autocomplete box. So very simple implementation once again. Um, we're pulling in all the transactions that we have, looking at transaction detail, which would be the uh, description in this case, and then we're just trying to match that with whatever was typed into the autocomplete box. Now if we come back to the Add Transactions page, there's actually um, something interesting to look at here. So if, if you Notice whenever you type something into the autocomplete box in this example, what we have it set up to do is simply suggest or make suggestions. So you type in a letter or a couple of letters, and you'll get a list view or a list view with some suggestions in there. But you'll see that that's all it does. Um, and you can see how we've set that up here with the autocomplete mode. We have it set to simply suggest. Uh, but we do actually also support other types of suggestion modes and they include the ability to append so that instead of seeing a list of other suggestions, it will actually finish out the suggestion for you as you type 
or you can choose to suggest and append, which does both. It will finish out the suggestion while also showing you a list of other uh, potential, potential suggestions. So we can actually quickly take a look at that um, here in our documentation. So here we have the three uh, different uh, suggestion display modes that we currently support, suggest, append, and suggest and append. And you can see some quick examples of what that looks like. So this is what appending looks like. Uh, you type in a letter or a couple of letters and it will f uh, finish out the word based on the nearest suggestion in the list. And of course if you suggest, uh, if you choose suggest and append, you get that as well as the list of other suggestions as you type. All right, and that pretty much covers the Add Transactions page. So let's go ahead and go back here and let's move on to the next page. So now we're going to be looking at the category and budget page, which as I mentioned before, um, it's a very simple uh, example of our data grid, but we're just going to um, take a look at it anyway. So let's pull that up. And so right on line uh, 16, you'll see where we start to define that data grid. And again, as I mentioned, um, we're not doing anything special. So what you can see here is a very simple implementation of data grid. So just a great example of how easy it is to get started and get uh, up and going with something like this. So all we're doing is we're binding to our item source and then we're creating that template that we saw, the data template we saw earlier for the category column. So we have our image which again is pointing to that image converter and then for the name we're pulling the value of that category name. And then lastly we have our budget column which is simply just pulling in the values uh, from the data model for that column. So nothing special but you can see here not a whole lot of code either required to get that get that going. So less than 50 lines of code uh, for this particular example of our data grid. All right, now let's move on to the last page here, which is the trends page. And again, this is the most interesting uh, example that we have here. So let's go ahead and dive right into that. All right, so starting on pay, our lines 10 and 11, you can see the, the resources we're pulling in here are the month spent converter and budget average converter. And so now if we look down to lines 12 uh, through 19, you can see that we have our first data template here. In this case, this is our data template for the data marker. And what that is, is the little box here you can see that is uh, connected to each slice of the pie. And so in this case, what we're pulling in is a percentage value, and then we're formatting that to a percentage. And then we're also pulling in the category of transactions that, the, that each slice of pie correlates to. And so that is the data marker template there. And if we move along to lines 32 to 52, we have, we're, we have our first chart here. So this is where we start to define the very first chart on the page. And you can see here on lines uh, 34 through 37 and then 39 through 42 where we start to define our primary and secondary axes for, for that chart. So in this case we're dealing with the column chart. And you can see that our primary axis here is a date time axis. And you can see that because we're displaying this by month. So we have the first three months of the year here, January, February, and March. Um, so that's how that date axis is, is um, set up. And then as we move along, looking at line, uh, starting at uh, between lines 44 and 51, we actually start to define which of these charts we're actually displaying. So line 45 specifically sets it as a column. And then from here, we start to make uh, or bind to the various data sources to display the data. So uh, for this column, we're using the month spent converter. And that's what's giving us the total number of transactions per month. Um, so if we take a look at that on the converter, you can see that that's what it's actually doing. So month spent converter is essentially looking at all the values for each of the months and then give it, giving us the totals. All right. And then we also have a fast line series, uh, or a fast line rather, uh, implemented on this particular column chart. And what this is, is this this is bound to our budget average converter. And as you can imagine by the name, all it's doing is it's giving us an average uh, budget line. So that's this dotted line here um, that you can see going across the columns. It's just a secondary um, a value essentially that's just giving us a, uh, the average budget for each of the three months. And so it gives us a nice visual way of seeing how close we are in this example to being either over, on, or under budget for each of the, the three months. 
All right, and if we keep going, so lines 59 through 69 start are defining our second uh, column chart. So it actually starts here um, on lines uh, 54 through 70, but inside of that, 59 through 69 actually define that chart as a pie chart. And so you can see that here on line 60. And so here you can see that we're binding our, our X and Y um, uh, axes to the category and the values from our expense view model. And then we're also uh, uh, have some additional binding statements here that are pretty interesting. So we have a uh, chart color model. And in this case, we're using a custom color palette. So there, there is a built-in default color palette that you can use. Um, but if you don't want to do that, you can specify your own and set it to custom. And then um, for custom brushes, we're, this is where we're binding to our custom category colors. So let's go ahead and actually take a look at that. Um, this is actually found in the expense view model. So let's go ahead and pull that up. And you can see here, first of all, that we do have a property here for category colors. And if we scroll down here on line 107, you can see where we're defining those colors. So we have a list of colors, and then we're just defining what those colors are here. And so the way this works is if you are defining your own custom color palette and you have your own custom defined list of colors, um, the pie chart series or any of the charts actually will pull from that list of colors and it will assign each value that you have to an individual color. If you have more data values than you have colors defined, then the, the, the chart series will simply repeat colors from that list. Otherwise, if you have more colors than you have data values, then you'll just have some wiggle room and you can add additional values without fear of repeating colors. So no need to worry if you've only specified, say, three colors and you have uh, you know, five different data points you'll simply see some repeat colors in the, uh, in the chart. All right. And so beneath that, then you see where we also bind to our data marker that we saw before. All right. And that's pretty much it as far as actually setting up those two charts. Now let's take a look at how we actually achieved uh, connecting these two together. How are we actually changing the values of the pie chart based on what we select in the column chart? So for that, what we're going to need to do is go back up to the top. And uh, if we look at the, uh, here on line 32 for the uh, column chart, you'll see that we actually have an event here, selection changed. So we've defined this event, and let's take a look at what's happening here. So all we're doing for the selection changed event, so whenever one of these uh, data points is clicked on, is we're, look, we're implementing a simple switch statement and we're basing it off of the selected data point index. So we have three different data points. Uh, starting from zero, we have zero, one, and two. And so you can see here, we have a case for each one of those different indexes. So for case zero, uh, we are setting the uh, item source of that pie chart, which is uh, defined here as chart series zero. And then we're changing the, the item source of it. So every time we select a new data point, the item source of that pie chart is being changed. And you can see here that we're simply looking up all the transactions where the date matches the value of uh, the month. And then we're uh, basically uh, bringing in all the transactions for that month and then setting that as the item source for that pie chart. So again, uh, relatively simple to understand in practice. Um, it's just a matter of uh, you know uh, setting that up in, in whatever way makes uh, sense for you. But um, the implementation here, again, as, as I've said uh, before, very simple to understand once you see what's going on in the background. All right, and that, that was it. So it's a very simple application, as I mentioned before. Um, and uh, you'll be able to actually uh, play with this yourself since we will be making the solution, uh, the project uh, available to you so that you can download it and run it yourself. You can actually uh, run it yourself on uh, various different platforms. So you can run it on your local machine, on an Android device, or an iOS device if you have the ability to do so. And you can see for yourself how well all of our components perform. So you'll be able to see the list uh, view scroll performance for yourself, for example, um, and, and everything else. So you can also see the, you know, the code for yourself and, and play with it if you'd like to, to learn more about how some of these things were, were achieved. All right, and with that said, I'm going to hand it back over to Whitney for some additional information on Syncfusion, and then we'll hop right into our Q&A session. Thanks, Aaron. That was fantastic. That was uh, really good, and I saw quite a few comments come in about how interesting that was. Um, again, as Aaron said, we'll be sharing the, the code sample, so um, keep an eye out for that in an email coming out in a, a few days' time. 
So before we move on to questions, uh, let me also mention our community license. So for smaller companies with revenue under $1 million US dollars, all of the SyncFusion products are available for free. So that includes um, everything you just saw Aaron demonstrating. It includes all the controls in Essential Studio Suite, as well as our enterprise solutions. So if you are also looking for a business dashboard or a, a big data processing uh, platform, that will all be covered as well, um, as long as you qualify. We have plenty of customers who've built up their businesses, starting with a community license, and we're always happy when more developers join our community. Uh, for those who don't qualify for the community license, we have an unlimited global license. So our, our global license is a flat fee subscription, which eliminates compliance and licensing headaches by making sure that everyone who needs a license can have one. That can include uh, third parties and contractors. So there's no surprise fees with a global license. You pay one flat fee that covers everything and you can focus on developing your projects instead of worrying about paying for your headcount or your maintenance or runtimes, royalties, uh, you know, nothing like that. It's all included in the one flat fee. So if you'd like more information on that, please visit us at syncfusion.com. So again, thank you all for joining us. Um, we hope that you enjoyed the webinar. Aaron, thanks again for presenting. I think there was a lot of uh, useful information in there. And um, everybody, please watch your email inboxes for a link to the recording of the presentation. We'll have a link, um, it should be to a, a GitHub repository. Um, and we really thank you for your time and interest. Uh, again, check out that community license, check out the free eBooks. Um, we've also got some other free tools like Metro Studio if you're looking to build uh, icons, um, lots of good stuff on our website. So again, thank you for your time and interest and we'll see you next time.